You're listening to After No War, broadcasting from the beautiful South Berlin, except no sandwich. Good morning, dear listeners. Welcome to another edition of Akdan Memor, the third in succession, um, including the a fair chunk of today's edition, which is one that Neil and I recorded um, regarding the FA charges that have also happened this week, or the, the FA inquiry into, into the Wigan game. Joining me um, to do this re-recorded introduction, because a large slice of what we spoke about the other day has been superseded by the news that's dominated me all these past few days. But joining me to show over the cut again, it's Neil Fissler. How are you, Neil? Not too bad, mate. Not too bad. Do you know this is the second time where we've had to scrap a show after a management sacking? What was the other one? Was that was that Harris when Harris went? I can't remember. What was the other I one? I it was Ian Holloway. When right. Okay. I believe it was one of my first ever appearances Right, well, going back, well, that will be back to 20, 2015, I think it was Holloway, that when, when he went, so, oh, wow. Yeah, well, and I didn't even know what a podcast was. <laughs> and he said, do you fancy having all that to the wall and talking about you dislike Holloway? And uh, I believe we recorded it one evening. Yeah. And unless I'm very much mistaken... I think as we were recording it, Millwall were announcing that Holloway <laughs> left, <laughs> and we didn't re- and we didn't know. And uh, all all of a sudden, we came off, and I think we had to uh, <laughs> hastily uh, re-record. Yeah. Now it, you say that, I, it's coming um, back to me. I, I, I'd completely forgotten that, listeners. But yeah, I think you're, you're, you're right, Neil. Um, that's wow. Time flies. That was eight years ago now. Um, it's incredible how we rattle these shows up, really. Um, but there we are. Yeah, um, we're obviously speaking, listeners, in the aftermath of the departure of Gary Rowett, Neil. Um, I was listening to a really, it was actually quite a good interview. Simon Jordan and Jim White on TalkSport were, were in conversation with Gary Rowett. I think this was, must have been yesterday, the clip that's doing the rounds on social media. Um it seems to be, I mean, I'm really struck by the the amicable nature of the parting. It feels like a divorce that everyone's will remain friends afterwards. One of those odd, odd kind of um, breakups where you wonder why you're breaking up at times. But it does, it was very amicably done. He, he came over well, I thought, Gary Rowe in his interview. I don't know if you heard it. I heard it live yesterday. I thought he said an awful lot without saying an awful lot as per normal with him. Uh, it's a little bit of word salad, isn't it? Mm a few management phrases in there and I think he probably had to I think he probably had to do it because he sees his future in yeah, yeah his immediate future in the media he said uh, that didn't he yeah he said he, he sees a, a, a media immediate media future for himself rather than back into management an amicable in many ways because otherwise there would have been all kinds of confidentiality clauses yeah, uh, this, that, and the other in payoffs, and I don't know. We did a show the other day, and or yeah, well, in yeah, well, in the immediate aftermath, I think within about mm. half an hour, I yeah. think we were recording, weren't we? Yeah, with the news breaking, and I don't know. I still think there's something, there's something not being said, right. It just seems the the timing to me still seems very, very, very strange. Considering that we've just had an international break, yes. I thought that to announce it on what Wednesday night was it? Was yeah, it and we're at early kick off at Preston on Saturday, so time is tight, isn't it? To say the least. Um, yeah, I agree. The timing does seem very, very odd. Um, what lies behind that, we, we, we're not going to know. I think maybe some some things stay behind closed doors and maybe they seep out in time. I don't know. But um, I do agree. It's preordained. Why not just try and limp through till the next, I think it's five weeks in the next international break, isn't it, or something like that? Uh, is there one in November? There is one in November, I think, mid-November. Um, yeah. So, so could you have not have got everything lined up and then gone then i don't know it just or even gone last week i i, I don't know i'm quite cynical mm. 
<laughs> yeah, which come as great surprise. That will come as a shock to a lot of our listeners, Neil. <laughs> it, just seems, it just seems odd. The timing of it seems odd. I don't know if he's gone up north or gone back home after last week. He mentioned uh, his family. I mean, his, his boy was 11 when he's come to Millwall. I mean, he's talking about Millwall as though it's some kind of like he's gone into the across the, the Iron Curtain or something. I mean, he's only a couple of hours oh, drive down the road. It's not that far. Um, I, family pressure, I get. You know, I, I understand that. But then that's football. You're in the wrong business, Neil, if you're looking for a settled I've home never, life, aren't you? I've never fully understood why he hasn't brought his family down to London. And mm. well, it, same with Ryan Lowe down here in Plymouth. Yeah, he didn't ever move his family down, but Schumacher did. Schumacher got the job. Yeah, uh, it, it just seems that okay, it's a couple of hours up the road. It's not exactly a great distance. He probably could commute it, mm. to be quite honest. But to live most of the week in Canary Wharf. I think he's got two older children, hasn't he? Didn't he's mentioned he... an older boy, yeah, who, who stays with him and uh, at this place he's got in Canary Wharf. So, you know, it doesn't sound like a bad setup. I mean, I'll be absolutely honest with you, listeners. I mean, I, I get the familial pressure. And he mentioned in the interview with Simon Jordan, Neil, that his daughter wants to go skiing, which he couldn't have done if he was still in the football season. So I get that you, you get to do stuff like that if you're not in the football world. But that's... You know, he's known about the football world since he was a kid because he's, he's played and he's managed. So none of that comes as, as a surprise. And I, I take your point about the timing. It's it, it's very awkwardly timed. Um, and we, we'll come on to the, the, the betting of the, the current favourites very, very shortly. But, um, you know, it, 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 I think it's as much as the club are trying to pretend that it was all, um, I don't know, you know, a, a, a recruitment process it almost implies it was planned it does seem to have come out of nowhere Adam Barrett um, said he was it was number two in, in his in his staff seems, seems to have been shocked by the departure so um, it does seem rather unplanned doesn't it I don't know if he's gone home and maybe things have been said I don't know it just maybe seems, maybe it just seems that oh he yeah, well, you normally do things at the start of an international window, not... Yeah, end. no, I, 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 100%. I mean, do if you haven't heard the interview, listeners, do have a check. It's on TalkSport. I did retweet it. If you go onto my feed, you'll find it on there under the... Um, uh, I think it goes under the reply section. But anyway, you'll, you'll find it one way or the other if you don't look on my one. But um, one thing I do hope, actually, now that he's gone, I do hope that H doesn't end up writing... Uh, his history of Millwall and <laughs> Millwall career in 20, 30 years' time because I think that we should be looking upon his tenure not with any great amount of fondness because of the standard of football yeah. and, the, and the football that was played. But he stabilised us as a championship side. We're now an established championship side. Yep. He led to two finishes of eighth place, one of... I think we've had two with under eighth, as, as did Neil Harrison, with different kinds of football. But you're right. Um, we've established ourselves as a with an expectation that we compete at the top end of the championship. You know, we, we, we've, we've tried and failed a few times. He makes that point in the interview. I, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm, I know what you mean, Neil. Um, I, I feel mixed about Gary Rowett's tenure because, on the one hand, as we've said a few times on these little succession of shows that, you know, and, and the ripples after him going, um, on the one hand, we've established ourselves and we're looking at eighth position, maybe fighting for the, that sixth spot, you know, to, to get into the playoffs. But um, I can't say I've enjoyed it for a long time either. So I'm, I'm rather mixed. And I, it asks questions of you as a football fan. How, you know, how far do you re- the results versus entertainment debate is a, like a tension in the game between uh, be watching a spectacle or the the kind of the one nil um, dead kind of result focus, if you if that makes any sense. So it asks questions of you as to what what you want to see it when you go to watch football. Um, it also, would... age comes into it a lot. Now we're of an age, yeah, or well, you're certainly older than me. Uh, <laughs> you, know, you know, where you go to the football, 
you don't go up and you don't meet mates for three hours before the game and yeah. three hours after the game. It's pretty much home football, home again. Yeah, yeah. You start to get to the age where you start to think, actually, I'm not enjoying this. I could be sat in the warm. Yeah, doing something that you're enjoying or watching something you're enjoying or whatever the case yeah. may be. So it exactly. poses questions. That's, that's why I think it'll be a mixed, a mixed kind of. Um, I, th- I think he used the word in the in the interview with Talksport on Talksport um, that he, he's built a platform, and that's I think he has built a platform. Whether you enjoy watching a platform built is <laughs> is probably the question you've got to answer individually, isn't it? Because that's yeah, what, what we've got. Um, to a certain extent, it mirrors Mark McGee's time. I think. Um, yeah. You know, Time, uh, where he established us, and then we got rid of him when the football wasn't it started great. to fall apart. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, he had the glory of the promotion season in there, and he inherited a terrific, terrific squad of players. Um, I thought you could talk about the, the the quality of the current squad. I mean, I think it has good and bad elements to it. But um, yeah, I don't know. History will be an interesting um, judge of Gary Rowe. He's not been bad, but he's not been brilliant either. In, no, in exactly. Um, it's so it's an in- interesting one. mix. It's kind of the middling, but you should be careful what you wish for because we have to get this appointment right. Well, we do. Let's look at the the runners and riders. I've literally just screenshotted the Sky Bet. Um, page on, on the next permanent mill manager, Neil. And favourite, um, we'll, we'll start with a favourite and go downwards, I think. Um, that six to four um, favourite at the moment is Kevin Muscat, which is an interesting... I mean, the, whether the bookmakers have any inside track on this, I, I don't know. They must they must have something. But... Yeah, well, our listeners are about to have an inside track up in told from somebody in football that there has been contact. Right, okay. Well, there we are then. So that makes him a favourite for Kevin Musket. Followed uh, six to four Kevin Musket. I'm going to sound like uh, was it John McKirrick for the older listeners. Uh, three to one Michael Bill, four to one John Eustace and Adam Barrett, who takes us to Preston tomorrow, is joint eights with uh, with Nathan Jones. Um, but Musket sounds like um, he's he's a clear a clear leader. It's going to be an interesting choice, Neil, if if that does indeed turn out to be so, doesn't it? Yeah, well, let's face it, it is an attractive job for somebody. Yeah. We are, we are an established championship side. Yeah. We've got a chairman who hopefully mirrors his father and was very patient, mm. was a good chairman, and we've got no reason to think why he wouldn't be. Building this training ground, hopefully it gets off the ground. Yeah. We just need to get other aspects of the club moving in the right direction. Okay, we haven't got the biggest budget, but I think that's taken into account. I think that's why you're given quite a lot of rope, aren't you? By yeah, um, uh, it's something we have to get right. I don't want Beal. No, you mentioned Beal the other day when we when we spoke on on the other show, Neil. And I'd rather I mean... Cindy Beal in charge, to be quite honest, <laughs> yeah, because I think I think this bloke has got absolutely zero loyalty. Uh, yeah, well, as he proved with QPR, yeah, he got the top job at QPR, then was straight off to Rangers as soon as somebody made him the offer. There's an he interesting was... um, sequence in the. Um... In the the interview with Son on on the loyalty question, the point you're making there about Beal, um, but uh, Gary Rowe obviously at one point had a reputation of being uh, a similar kind of figure in that way, Neil, didn't he? Um, overly ambitious. I think Rowe used that word himself about you know moving on, dumping dumping clubs to get the bigger club, that kind of thing when he went to Stoke. Um, and he, he, you know, I think now you know he kind of learned his lesson a little bit, as he as he, he might put it, of um, building something. Whether Beal would learn that similar lesson or not, I don't know. I mean, Musket is an interesting choice if that's where we if that's where we go to. Um, we all remember Kevin Musket, the player, Neil, and we all know what you know what um, what that means. And you only got to look for his Wikipedia entry. To, uh, I think it's twelve red cards over his career, and I can't remember it was over a hundred yellow cards. So he's known as being, um, you know. Uh, 
a, a tough, tough player, to put it lightly. Uh, but he was a very good player as well. That's the other side of the Kevin Musket coin. And I'm going to presume and hope that that's the kind of side of him that he's taken into football management because you can't just be you can't just be a stereotype hard man in, in management. You've got to have the soft side as well. Yeah, that's right. But he has to be the right appointment. We've got to forget this sentimentality. Yeah. Uh, he has to be the right person for the job. People will point, oh, well, he won stuff when he was assistant of Ange Postacoglu. In, mm-hmm. uh, you can say his name. I, I struggled with his name in the previous show, Postacoglu. Exactly. Yeah, but that's why I sent you the voice note. That's why you're a proper journalist and I'm just an amateur. <laughs> And he's done a good job. I think he, I think he's had Yokohama or somebody. Yeah, he's had some success in Japan. Yeah, titles. Yeah, but that doesn't mean an awful lot. This is the championship. He didn't have a great time in Belgium. I think the Saint Trinians or somebody. <laughs> somebody like that is some but. <laughs> horses for courses. He was ultimately overlooked for the Rangers job. Yes, he was. Yeah. So, yeah, come over, but it has to be the right appointment. Funnily enough, I've just called up the, I've just called up the Sky Bet odds. I don't think we'll give it to Adam Barrett at eight to one. I've got to be honest. What about Emma Hayes at sixteens? You're you're you're, you're uh, known for your woke views, Neil. I mean, would that that would be quite? You random. know what? Yeah, <laughs> she's actually twenty five to one. At, she's moved well, out of sixteens when I uh, snapshotted it earlier on. Yeah, well, bet Victor have got her at twenty five. Twenty five. I think she will take a job in in man, in uh, managing a men's team. Yeah. At some point, I know that she. Uh, she had the chance to go to AFC Wimbledon, I think, last season. Right. But has a sights on loftier things. Funnily right. enough, I was thinking this when I saw her at 25 to 1 yesterday. The Wokarati would love it. You would get <laughs> all kinds of sponsorship and attention. But I don't think Millwall is the right job for her. The names I'm looking at here, I'm just looking at this 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 um, betting list here. Musket, Beal, Eustace. Eustace obviously has, has done well at Birmingham, and so I suppose he's the one that brings the most um, uh, credentials, if you want to put it that way, to the table. Um, whether he'd be interested in coming to Millwall or not, and whether he'd be the right choice, I I don't know, listeners. I generally don't. Adam Barrett, we've. We've had in place for a while. He seems to be making a pitch. He put a, 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 a shot a video in the gym yesterday talking about the, the what he wants from the team going yeah. forwards. I don't no, sorry. He yeah, well, he isn't for me. This isn't a first timer's job. Well, this is this is what takes I mean, you know, we've been talking about Emma Hayes, for example. I know she's proven in women's football, but um it is a big stage and I think there's gonna be a balance between trying to find the the unknown diamond, you know, so the the Ange Posto Postacoglu idea that you find somebody from Aussie football who can then make it in in, in English football is an appealing one, but there's also got there's, they've got to balance that with the the what if, you know, um, Gary Rowett did bring some proven ability to manufacture and achieving if dull teams, and you know that that must play part. Of the you know play part of the, the James Barrelson's thinking here, I would I would imagine. Mark Kennedy's an interesting one there, Neil fourteen to one on my on my screenshot here. Um, you mentioned him at Link, uh, leaving Lincoln the other day. Yeah, I again don't think he's got enough experience. Nathan Jones at eight to one's interesting. Yeah, yeah, very interesting. He although he's another he isn't he another. Gary Rabbit type did very well at Luton, didn't he? And then went to Stoke and did nothing. didn't do much at Stoke or Southampton. Was he at Southampton as well? Then I think he went back to Luton, or was it the other way around? Can't remember. And uh, went to Southampton on absolutely astronomical money, as you do when you're in the Premier League, mm. and lasted what six weeks or something, didn't they? Yeah. So, there might be a little bit of there might be a little bit of uh, he might want to write that wrong. Dean Smith at sixteen to one, not for me. Ryan Mason at sixteen to one, 
yeah. very highly rated at Tottenham, has had a couple of spells in charge of Tottenham. Yeah. But again, a uh, bit of a gamble. Warnock at 18s, 10 years ago, I'd have bit your hand off for him. Yeah, he's, he's, he's was 70 in his 70s. Not that his age should be any particular barrier, nor, nor should you know any other factor in it being realistic, but it does, it does make Goff you think, him. you know. Good um, win. God knows who he is. Is, is he more? Know, is, he, is he doing the ironing at, at the, in the kit room or something? I don't know. He's starting to get yeah. that feel about Joey it. Barton's intriguing. Joey That's Barton. What, can, you, <laughs> can you imagine Joey Barton having a row with him? Oh, mate. No, I can't imagine that. Um, um, the whole of the ground would pile. Oh, mate. Uh, <laughs> it, it, I think that once you start getting down to like Emma Hayes and below, yeah, it's a bit of a you're in, you're into the the silly season as uh, Joby McEnough put it in one in, in a poorly judged interview the other day. Um, it's going to be interesting. Twenty five to one, absolutely zero chance is there really? <laughs> Lee Bowyer twenty five to one. Lee one Bowyer. It because of his Charlton, his Charlton linkage, that's right, and and yeah, I mean, you know, these these things have to be. Steve Morrison twenty five to one. There's more chance of me, you, and Harry being put in charge, <laughs> and Steve Morrison at twenty five to one. Morrison's so, doing 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 well at Hornchurch, listeners, but at Hornchurch, that's the crucial part of that sentence. Right. He's doing so well at Hornchurch. Thirty three to one. What idiot! comes up with these names. Well, these are just random names, aren't they? They're, they're they are. Point, they right. are. I think, that, I think that the top five or six, although I did notice we were talking about Barrett's, they do say in the in the disclaimer hmm. that a temporary or caretaker manager is in charge for 10 competitive games will be deemed permanent and will be settled as a winner. Right. Okay. So, whether Adam will get ten games or not, I, don't, I suppose it, he's got a big chance on Saturday at Preston to to impress. You know, yeah. Well, we've got three games in a week. Yeah. <laughs> so, you, so he's almost halfway there. Well, last time he had three games in a week, I think he produced a win, a loss, and a draw, didn't he? So that <laughs> didn't get him the job. So let's see. Um, interesting, interesting times. We have no particular insight. Although Neil was as as. as had his, had his contacts and Musket has apparently maybe nudging forward in the pack. Let's 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 see, Neil. Um, Neil, we're going to cut over now to the uh, conversation that you and I did the other day, which is about the FA charges that were levelled at Mill, which we pled guilty to. So we're going to close this little introduction, which is a re-record because a lot of what we said the other day was was superseded, um, and then we're going to cut over now to. Nils and I had my conversation the other day regarding the recent FA versus Millwall case hearing. So uh, thank you for joining me this morning, Neil. That's an absolute pleasure. Are we not doing a pundit games question today then, Nick? Oh, OK. Yeah, that's, actually, I did have one. And I, I, I got straight into the action. Let's, let's do a pundit games question. Punditgames.co.uk. Every time you buy the uh, the number one football quiz game, it's the number one Millwall show, and it's the number one football quiz board game, Christmas Looms, dear listeners, but there's a drop down. You select uh, Millwall as your team, and the Lions Food Hub gets uh, a, a nice little payout if we sell enough of these games. So that's why we do this, which is why we do the show. And we give you a taster question in each edition. So just to close this bit, I'll read the answer. I'll give you the answer straight afterwards, actually, because I, I won't really be able to slide it in at the end. But um, so, Neil, this is from the English football Premier League in the 2000s. This is a Paraguayan who was a prolific. Um, Goal scorer at um, Blackburn, prolific. He scored 23 goals at Blackburn in 2007 to 2009. Uh, he joined Manchester City 2009 to 13, played just 20 times and scored three times. Not so successful at Blackburn, uh, to Manchester City rather, sorry. Uh, then went back to Spanish football, Malaga, Betis, and then on to um, Mal- uh, South American football, Cruz Azul, and Olympia and Libertad. So Paraguayan played for Blackburn late 2008, uh, moved to Manchester City in a big money move in 2009, where he was less successful. Um, and then go, went to Spanish and South American football after that. Played for the Paraguayan national team 
112 times between 1999 and 2016, 32 goals. And the answer to that question, if you don't know it, Neil? I don't, actually. I've not got a Scooby. The answer to that question, listeners, if you haven't got a Scooby, or if you do have a Scooby, you'll know that it was Roque Santa Cruz. Roque Santa Cruz played for Blackburn um, 2007 to 9, 57 times in the Premier League, 23 goals. Manchester City, 20 times, three goals. Then back briefly to Blackburn on loan, and then off to Spain and South America. Roque Santa Cruz. So, for that and more questions like it, go to punditgames.co.uk and select your middle drop down so the Lions Food Hub gets their nice little payday. Neil, thank you for joining me, mate. We're going to cut over now to the FA inquiry conversation from the other day. Until the next edition, listeners, Arriva Dirty Millwall. Achtung, Millwall. Just neatly on to the main reason for you and me speaking, which is um, this very strange, in my opinion. Um, charge, FA charge that we've had this week over alleged, I still say alleged sectarian chanting at the game versus Wigan and Millwall played on the 22nd of April. It was a 2-1 win for Wigan. It was an awful performance by the Lions that day, listeners. And I know that because I was there and I actually did a show um, and I might stick the link out for that. It's not worth listening to for the football, but it is worth listening to for whatever you can pick up of the crowd noise because... um, this is a strange, in my opinion, charge that we've pleaded guilty to. The club has pleaded guilty to um, three alleged um, incidents where James McLean, the Panto villain, um, who I think brings as much to the party as he gets back. But anyway, there we are. But there, it's the allegation, Neil, is that in th- on three occasions, namely the 8th, the 12th and the 45th minute of a game, first half then, um, en masse, and I want to come back to that word, en masse. This is in the 27-page report, listeners. I've read for it so that you don't have to. Um, there's an en masse chant from the Millwall supporters, as they put it, of fuck the Pope and the IRA. I bought a flute for 50 pence, and the only thing that I could play was fuck the Pope and the IRA. And this, this chant is repeated, allegedly, in the 8th, 12th, and 45th minute. Now, one thing I will say, Neil, and you know, I'm, I'm not in a position to oppose their their video footage. Apparently, this is based on video footage supplied to the FA by Wigan Athletic. Um, we're not going to see it. We're never going to hear it, and it doesn't even exist now. Because one of the things that did make me laugh is that this parrot has been deleted now, so you, no one could ever see it if they wanted to. But I didn't hear that. And as we were saying just off air before we started speaking. Um, I've been around the Millwall track plenty of times and I kind of know what, you, what you're what you going to hear when you go to plays in. We all know what um, James McLean brings when he when he takes the field and we, knows, we all know what gets said. Um, certainly, there was, there was abuse towards him. I didn't hear that song. I bought a flute for 50 pence. The only thing I could play was Fuck the Pope and the IRA. Never heard that one at Millwall in my life. Um, I don't know if any listeners out there agree with that or... Um, if they have heard it, or some people think it's the most brilliant thing in the world to sing. I've seen stuff on on Twitter that, that think think that. I've never heard it, and I didn't hear it at Wigan. So I'm slightly amazed that this charge has been accepted by the club. Well, I think it, I think it's pretty spineless <laughs> to accept it unless it is particularly audible, and they've thought, well, yeah, but it's pointless. Yeah, but it's pointless. Yeah, defend the um, charge if it is sung and they have picked it up somehow. Uh, maybe they've just thought. But I think that really, I think the FA are out for us. I think they I think we've got. Well, okay, uh, I agree there. Yeah, yeah. With one or two things, and I think we should just give them a sum of money at the start of the season and say, "There you go, that's fine <laughs> in advance," because it seems as if they're determined to nail us for something. You've got far worse happens inside the football ground. I know tragedy chanting, as they call it, yeah. is a big thing. Uh, Liverpool uh, caused national outrage with their antics when it comes to the national anthem and built mm. through minute silences and whatever else. And well, you must not go down that path anyway. Uh, 
No. But it just seems that there's far worse goes on inside football grounds. And from researching the 87-88 season, you could see that the, the club got a hell of a lot of bad publicity back then. Okay, some of it was probably quite right. Uh, we probably did some things that we shouldn't have done. Mm. But there's always been this thing that we've got to get Millwall for something. We've got to nail Millwall for something. And uh, I think we've got off with a couple of things in the past, haven't we? I think... We have. I mean, they mentioned the Everton incident from uh, the FA Cup game 2019, I think that was. Um, the strangeness of this, um, I mean, having gone through all 27 pages of it, I've, I've got loads of um, highlights of it. So I don't want to go through the whole thing. But what what I... What struck me is at the, the, the end part of this is there's no financial penalty because Mill, I think, have accepted this and have this, you know, put their hands up to this happening. And we haven't and never will hear the video clips that we're going to allege this song being sung, which I didn't hear. And I don't know if anyone else out there heard it, but maybe they did, maybe they didn't. I don't know. But the allegation rests on, 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 the, on, the, on the set wording, and that is... The volume of the chanting, this is directly from the, um, the FA report. In the, in the video footage, the offensive chanting is clearly audible and involves a very substantial number of Mill supporters chanting the phrases complained of, this business of the Pope and the IRA. Um, the volume of the chanting leads to the inevitable conclusion that a, cons- a very considerable number of Mill supporters engaged in the religious the religious discriminatory chanting. It, that's the thing that's um, that this rests on. Yeah, but it's um, aspects of it, isn't it? The Pope part of it. Yeah. Same thing um, like about James McLean. Uh, <laughs> and well, let's face it, it is warranted. I've seen pictures of him on his Instagram sitting down in a balaclava. I've seen he, that, yeah. His, With like IRA style <laughs> balaclava. It, yeah. it, that's just. That's just he's got no. he's got a tattoo which he displayed. I mean, he showed his. Yeah. I presume it was the tattoo. I was too far away to see well, showing his yeah. his ass to the Millwall fans when it they were going to take a corner. It's some it's something to do with dairy of Sunday bloody Sunday or something, isn't it? Yeah, it's it's, it's the free dairy um, mural. He's got it tattooed um, on his leg. So, um, so he's complicit in an awful lot of this to be honest, and he won't wear a poppy. They played the national anthem at a pre-season friendly. Again, I don't know why anybody would do that, but he turned Mm. his back on it, yeah? Mm. So, it's no surprise that football fans' conscience, which is Millwall fans, (laughs) in our role as national conscience. Yeah, of football fans, yeah. (laughs) Which we seem to have adopted that role. <laughs> we do, we do, we do. Mor- the moral policeman yeah. of football. Yeah, we are. <laughs> we are. That we get into more trouble for that than he does of provoking via Instagram, uh, showing. And um, yeah, but let's be frank. If he showed that tattoo to Millwall fans, it's to provoke us. Well, that's right. Um, um, yeah, well, maybe that was taken into account, although it's, it's probably not mentioned in the report. I mean, what I would say to this is my view, listeners, and you can, you know, call me Mister Mister Wokery or whatever you want to call me. I don't know, but you are entitled in this society that where we we still is largely you are still free to hold whatever opinions you choose to. the The problem comes down to where you display those opinions and put them in front of people's face. So. You know, were I to turn my back on the Irish national anthem, which I wouldn't do because I would respect it, would I? Were I to run along in front of Irish fans with a, I don't know, uh, trying to think, a, a Union Jack um, tattoo or some depiction of some atrocity or something, showing it to them, and you know, um, if I was to conduct myself in that way, let me put it that way, I would expect there to be a torrent of abuse directed at me. Um, he is entitled not to wear a poppy. I, I, I think you have, everyone has that um, choice. It's not. It shouldn't be ever. Fair play. Yeah, well, that's fair play. We're in a society where you can pick and choose what. I don't agree with that choice, but that's his. That's his. His call. I, I, I've bought a poppy all of my life, and I, I will continue to do so. 
but that's his choice. Um, and the same with, you know, whatever you may think of another country or another national anthem or whatever. I think there's a certain decorum that says, you know, you see it in the international matches, you stand with, not quite to attention, it's not military, but you stand with, you know, to, to, to respect the anthem. Um, and I don't like it, particularly when other countries' anthems are booed in internationals. I know it's become part of the um, the thing and people laugh about it, but it don't, don't do anything for me. But um, anyway, he's, he's entitled to his opinions and I, I wouldn't ever deny anyone, you know, no matter how um, much I would agree or disagree with them, and I don't agree with, with a, a lot of his opinions, but you can't expect the, to display those allegiances, Neil, and not draw comment back so that seems to it seems to rest on this idea that on mass and i certainly wasn't on mass uh at wigan because I, I can say that because i was there i would love that there was a definition this, of on mass means because oh no it must mean the majority it must it's got to mean it would substantial and so well, that would be a vast majority of those four thousand fans or however many we took there was i think there was 1200 that went up there and so you've got to be talking at least a third of them? I don't know. What would all mess mean in that situation? Now, there was no way on earth. I mean, there was plenty of abuse. Don't get me wrong, listeners. I'm not a, not a naive man. You know, I've followed the line since the early 70s, so I know what gets said. And we, we do have some fans that have this bizarre, um, in my opinion, allegiance with Scottish football. You know, they, they seem to want to... Rangers and Millwall is a thing. I, I, Glasgow Rangers means nothing to me. I, it never has done. I, I don't quite understand why people want to draw a link with um I think it's sectarianism. You know. I think it's all to do with the with the union jack. I don't know. I don't understand it and I don't particularly care <laughs> to be quite well, honest. It, it, yeah well I'm with you. It doesn't mean very much to me. Yeah but I don't like politics very much and I certainly don't like religion. So no, <laughs> the, the dragging in of the Pope is a new one. I've, I've never ever come across that at the Den. Um, apparently, that that's I mean, it's one of the, the club's points back. They've accepted the charge, listeners. So they they it's guilty, Your Honour, so to speak. It's not a court of law, but yeah, well, I guess, uh, what, uh, yeah, well, I guess if there's video evidence, uh, if there's video evidence, well, but we've not heard that. Yeah, um, I can only say what I heard. You have to accept it, to be quite honest. If you present it with audio of those yeah be, or that song being sung then i'd love to hear that i'd love no I'm, that's the wrong way to put it listeners but i i didn't hear no, it i was there yeah we, and i'd like I'm, with evidence i know what you mean yeah I, I would i would like to hear that because it's got past me and if it's sung on that on three occasions then on three occasions, I know that I'm getting past me my sixties now, Neil, and you know you you start to lose your sensory faculties a little bit. But it certainly beat me. I didn't hear it. Um, and as the club has said, there's never ever been an issue with sectarian chanting at Mill before or since. And that's one thing that I would say because um, by accepting these charges, and maybe if it's on video, okay, you got to put your hand up and say there it is. Um, but it, it kind of, in the eyes of the world, and you see all the usual, I know it's no one likes us and we don't care, so why do we give a shit? But we are not a sectarian club. We will accept anyone. If you're playing for the Millwall show and give 100%, I don't. I genuinely believe this, that Millwall fans will not care who you are, where you come from, or what your religion or anything else is, if you're giving 100%. You know, we can all think of good examples of players like that over the years from all, all countries. So, but by accepting this, it says that we we have a sectarian problem at the Den, and I don't believe we do. I genuinely don't believe believe that. Because... You know, I just think it was a one-off because of James McLean, and hopefully we don't play, uh, we don't draw Wrexham in the FA Cup where he is now. Yeah, he's going down the leagues now, and he? he's on uh, finding his level. So, just yeah, but um... I am hating Britain and everything that Britain stands for. He's play for another British club I don't quite yeah. get that but I just think it's just one of those things that you've just got to almost just yeah fair enough the good thing is they haven't sanctioned us as such I guess. there's no financial penalty no, yeah. no only an action plan which you know we, we action plans um, we've got plenty of those already at the but I'm not we, sure um... how a club can be held responsible they can do many things inside the football ground, 
apart mm. from tying electrolytes to your bollocks when you walk in there. <laughs> <laughs> or, or, or tipping bird shit over you, like okay, in, in yeah. the block one. <laughs> yeah, but automatically then lights up and uh, gives you a jolt every time you 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 trip a sensor that's sent the uh, that's got pre-programmed words in it. There's not an awful lot you can do. I did think at Plymouth. The, the next chance to get us into trouble will be mm. take it up the arse. Yes, yes, yes. That will that will fall foul of, of um, yeah. Even yeah. though it's not meant I mean, to be in a yeah, it's, it's meant it's meant as, it's meant as working class humour, which is rough and ready, and it's built on the uh, the building site where you give as good as you get. This kind of yeah approach industrial let's call it that you know but you know what i mean by that um and we do in many people's eyes we do represent something football has changed i mean you know let's state the obvious um and this this particular case that we're talking about here with the the mclean thing is it's an interesting one because when you read the meat of the of the um of the report Mill actually checked with the EFL representative, and who knew that they have an an EFL representative for these matters, but they do, as to whether anti-IRA chants, which I did hear, and I wouldn't ever, you know, I'm not going to pretend I didn't, um, whether that falls foul of any um, guidelines. And and the answer to that is no, it doesn't. They're a terrorist organisation. I check that they, they are still a prescribed terrorist. I looked on gov.uk. Well, are they? I don't know. We've had the whole the peace process in in Ireland, you know. But yes, they are listeners. They're they're on there with the all the, all the, the unsavoury groups you can think of in this in this world, and there there they are. So they're a prescribed terrorist organisation. Yeah, Mill will um, need to be added to that list. <laughs> <laughs> I'm fascinated with the whole Pope part. I mean, it's like we've got some kind of theological group that are campaigning for the, you know, for it was someone said the anti popes of the 15th century. Maybe they're all in favour of the alternative popes that used to set up in, in France and places. I don't know. Um, yeah, anyway, apparently we checked out uh, and the, the, re- the reply came back from the EFL that um, the, the chant, and I, th- I suppose if they're directed at a person, it might become a problem. I don't know, because that can take you into it being a, a you know a directed at an individual allegations i suppose but anyway um so yeah it's it, it's it's a strange one the whole thing is a very strange event and we've we've said guilty and the outcome of that is no financial penalty which whereas i was reading that barnsley and blackpool have both been done for similar um sectarian chanting as it was described and um, they've been fined twenty and thirty thousand pounds respectively, respectively. So uh, we haven't had any financial. I wonder whether we've said guilty, um, so that we don't get, you know, like maybe, maybe you don't get you don't get a fine for it. Um, I don't know. Um, I had to laugh at one point, which was that, uh, on the morning of the fixture. And I'm reading directly from the report here, Neil. On the morning of the fixture, we will see CEO Steve Kavanagh discuss the issue, which is the chances of James McLean being abused and uh, someone crossing a line within that abuse with an influential supporter. And in, this supporter said they would try and have a word with supporters in the away section. I mean, who was that? It wasn't me, listeners. I can tell you that much because I don't think I carry any influence with anyone, Neil. Do you agree? <laughs> yeah, but some people would call you an influencer, Nicholas. But, uh, <laughs> I'm certainly not going to walk around the away section at Wigan asking people not to sing naughty songs. So this, this, I'm not going to do that for anyone. Yeah, but nobody <laughs> seems to know who it is. I've spoken to no. a couple of well-known... Uh, Influential fans. <laughs> find out if it was them. And they're certainly not agreeing oh, to it. Dear. I'm just wondering if it's uh, if it's a bit of face dressing from Millwall. Somebody, yeah, I'd love to. Uh, <laughs> somebody did put up a couple of rather rather <laughs> unusual names, and one certainly has got no influence, and the other <laughs> only got a bit of influence if it pays. I think. <laughs> Uh, I don't know. Yeah, but that did make me laugh. I think it was something that Millwall have concocted to, to almost say that we tried to head this off at the pass. We have spoken yeah. to influential support. 
<laughs> you <want matches. laughs> hey, me. <laughs> no you one takes any notice of me. <laughs> you imagine somebody being sent around uh, the, the, the yeah. give it the JJB or whatever it's called these days to say, uh, <laughs> yeah, excuse me, chaps, can we not direct any abuse at... Uh, yeah, well, the, that nice Mr. Yeah. McLean with, yeah. with his tattoo on his leg and his, uh, yeah, and his well known forget, views. Yeah, but can we forget all of the paedophilic uh, assisting <laughs> that's come from the Catholic <laughs> Church and the fact that they are. Uh, uh, and the football industry itself. Oh, that's, that's, you know, whatever. Escape from <laughs> justice to. Uh, South America during the war because after all we don't want to well we don't want to run foul of a uh, uh, EFL regulation <laughs> number three do we honestly I think that they have to be seen to be doing something to this woke or to this woke world don't they uh, yeah but it doesn't help when you've got uh, when you still have all of these things rammed down your throat so see that last night. They had a minute silence for a second game running for Israel and two people that were killed yeah. in Belgium. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, yeah. It, it it just gets to a stage where I don't know if it. No, I I, came with I thought it, this, but I'm weary of it. Any time there is something, I I yeah, I just think, oh no, not again. Didn't we have something before a game recently? I mean, I'm, I'm you know, I, I hate to say it's, it's, it is a dehumanising thing to say this, that, you know, you, there is so much bad news going on at the moment. There's so many atrocities around the world, and we all know what these, these are. We come to football for an escape from it. And I, I'm, I don't know if I'm being naive in saying this, Neil, but we had... Um, I don't know what it was. It wasn't a minute's silence. It, was, it, was, it can't have been applause, but it was for the Moroccan earthquake... Um, which is a terrible thing, you know, and Tunisia and Algeria, Morocco, and, Africa, and I, you know, I, I don't, it don't was, diminish yeah. that. It but was. what's it got to do with? What's it got to do with football? And what's it got to do with with the football league? A fixture, you know, might have been whole whole city. Well, you know, I, football has football seems to see itself as some kind of conscience. We've we joked already about Mill being the moral policeman of football, but. I think football itself sees itself as such, but then it's picky about what it what it chooses to back and not back. So it does. I don't know. It, it, yeah, it's like this thing about painting the or lighting the Wembley arch up in the in blue and white, wasn't it, for the Israel flag? Yeah, and yeah, it's just all this virtue signal. It's can you out virtue signal the next person? Like, I don't mind minutes applause for something that's worthy of it, yeah? But brings us quite... Now, they stopped the game after 44 minutes at Plymouth for somebody that... Had oh, this is the fan who died there, wasn't it? The, the, the Very sad, but yeah. It's 44 minutes in... I, I, I don't get why, quite, yeah, quite funnily enough, we're in the 44th minute of recording this podcast. <laughs> Let's have an applause for something, come on. No, but I... Not, <laughs> Yeah, but, well, for a minute's applause for my reputation because I'm not seen as having any influence. <laughs> yeah, well, we've actually managed to get through 44 minutes talking about nothing, really. Uh, but for me, it just seems far more appropriate to have something before the start of the game rather than stop yeah. the game a minute in and interrupt the flow of play to have a... Yeah, but it's somehow... No, I agree. It's crept agree. in and they say, oh, it's respectful. No, it's more respectful to have it. At the start of the game, because during the game, I'm invested in the game. No, I agree, I agree. Um, to have a minute's applause. No, I, I think footballers, I mean, I was, I was thinking to the past, you can't build your whole world on what happened in the past. But if a major football figure passed away, then there was a minute's silence. So the, 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 the minute's applause probably is better because otherwise, as soon as you have a silence, it's begging there to be to be shouted over by some somebody somewhere, so it will happen. At some, yeah, some wag will shout to his mate. Yeah, all those down. So the minutes applause has its place, but it, uh, for me personally, keep it to football or major major figures such as the Queen when she passed away or something. I don't know, but the, you can't react to every single incident. And 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 the, you're right. This this thing of um, you know, stopping the game. 
for Terrell Alpo was very strange, very strange indeed. Um, I think we've probably run out of um, yeah. we've run out of gas on this we call it the conversation. <laughs> <laughs> if we, if we, we'll probably have another FA report now, um, you know, but no fine uh, listeners from me all, but an action plan. Maybe we'll have an action plan for our show. Yeah, we certainly won't be getting a BAFTA or a football. <laughs> Or a Football Supporters Association Award, Nick, I think, after this show. No, I've, I've not really got involved in that. Um, I, I, I did have a conversation with the, 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 um, that Mill podcast that put themselves forward for the Football Supporters Association Awards. And I think they put TT, um, who does some good stuff. And there's, there's, in, in their different ways, all of the various Mill podcasts do, in my opinion, a valuable service they give people different different approaches and that's that's what it's all about but i've i've decided neil that i'm not going to go chasing after these ball balls because they are just ramps to sell tickets to overpriced dinners um exactly. and, and 100%. that's all it is it's all it is um, and they're stitched up um yeah but let's be honest it's done on the fans vote yeah and the clubs that win it Clubs with bigger support bases than we've got. So, yeah. well, honestly, it's just a waste of fucking time. I went to the um, the event. It was a couple of years ago. It was just after COVID had kind of finished, so it was the first time you could go out really without having your, uh, having to wear a mask and all that business. And it was just we, we managed to whittle the the ticket price, which started about one hundred and eighty pound a person or something like that. In the end, I got it down to a hundred quid, and I took my wife to this dinner over at a hotel in uh, Kensington. And honestly, I thought the main course there, Neil, was the starter because it was so little food. You know, you, you it, it was one of those events where you needed to have stopped off at McDonald's, or certainly you would stock up, stop at McDonald's on the way home because you weren't going to be eating much. Um, the, the 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 wine was piss poor, listeners. You know, I'm not a judge of wine, but I know when it's pony, and that was pony. Um, and the whole thing was just way, way over, uh, you know, overhyped. And AFTV were there; they were winning stuff. And uh, the whole thing and Fogden, this bloke called Fogden. Uh, oh, Jesus, it was the whole it thing was a awful. Bloke from North London who supports Bolton, whose old man's <laughs> worth a few quid, so yeah. he's actually got a following, mate. It's just it's full of people that, I oh, mate, I watch. Uh, the Misfits boxing the other night because I was quite interested. The online, the the the, the influencers that fight each other. Yeah, yeah, Tommy Fury against KSR. Yeah. I was quite interested in it to be honest. Yeah. And uh, total hands up. Uh, but the people on the undercard, I think I'd heard of one of them, <laughs> and that was and that was uh, the Paul brother. Yeah. yeah, I'd heard of him, but I haven't heard of anyone else. It seems to be only fans prostitutes who want to, <laughs> to earn a few quid. Uh, but I haven't heard of half of these people. No. They certainly don't influence me to do anything, apart no. from not to find out who they are, because I don't really give a fuck. Let's be honest. <laughs> it's just, oh, I don't know. It's just, uh, yeah, well. yeah, but it's just the modern world, isn't it? As, as we've said, I think you have to accept that these people are the are the Morecambe and Wise of our day, really, aren't they? And yeah, we do work stars, but yeah. the modern day, the modern day equivalent. I never thought of it that way, but that's a good good way to to uh, to think of it. I think we'll close it there, Neil. I'm going to try and influence you all out there, listeners. I, I didn't get the call from Steve Cavanagh, but I'll try and influence you now. Stop! Stop with the anti popery business. <laughs> Don't do it, kids. Yeah, but I think it's safe to say that it won't be happening again, Nick, and it won't be. <laughs> That's all down to me. It's all down to me. And that <laughs> little... <laughs> no, it's fine. Great talking to you, Neil Fistler. Thank you, mate. Thanks for coming on the show. Yeah, no problem, Nick. Afton, Neil Wall.